Welcome to this presentation covering chapter three of our textbook and also the related material in module three. So let's get started. I'm going to focus on the PowerPoint. You'll find the PowerPoint in module three. It's the first item. It's actually called Case Law and Judicial Opinions PowerPoint. I've already downloaded that. I'm just going to go ahead and open that up. And here we're going to get started on this particular document. There we go. So let's begin. Um, most of what legal professionals do involves reading and making sense of cases. Um, that's different than what you, an attorney in a diff, or a paralegal in a different uh, non-common law jurisdiction might do as a routine matter. Yes, of course, we have statutes and regulations, and those are important to our system as well. But I would say the average attorney spends significantly more time looking at cases than he or she does looking at statutes or regulations. There are exceptions to that. There are certain practice areas that are statutorily or regulatorily dense. Um, and certainly in those areas, the attorneys and paralegals focus primarily on the statutes and the regulations. But I would say the average attorney and paralegal spend more time looking at cases than regulations and statutes in the United States. As a result, being able to understand and look at an opinion and make sense of it is really important. I like to compare looking at an opinion kind of like looking at a sonnet. Uh, for those of y'all that have um, uh, an experience with uh, English literature, you may be familiar with the English uh, sonnet structure. I'm just going to pull, pull up a Shakespearean sonnet so we can just get an example of what that looks like. And I'm going to, well, I'll pick the very first one. It has a certain structure to it. We can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 verses. And we can see a rhyme pattern. It's A, B, A, uh, then we, that one doesn't seem to rhyme, but die and eyes rhyme. Anyway, the, the rhyme sequence is, is established and, and doesn't vary usually from, from, the, from a particular pattern. It's different than the Italian sonnet format. You'll also notice that this is an iambic pentameter. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. That rhythm, that number of beats and that rhythm is part of the poem. But if I'm just sitting down and reading this for the first time and I have no context, this is a really weird document. I'm looking at it going, well, why do most lines end with a comma? Why is the line so jagged on this side? Why do the first letter in line start with a capital letter even though it's not the beginning of a sentence or a proper noun? What the heck is going on with these rhymes? Why is it this length? I'm not going to really understand what I'm reading unless I know the rules of an English sonnet. Once I know the rules, then I can make sense of where does this meet the standard? Where does this vary from the standard? Well, why did the author vary the standard in this case? All of those questions can pop up. But if I don't know the standard from which I can compare this particular sonnet, I'm not really going to be able to fully understand what's going on. It's a similar idea with uh, opinions. If I've never looked at an, an, a judicial opinion from the United States, I don't really know where to look to find the information that I need, or I won't even know what information I should expect to find. So um, it's important to have some experience with it so that you're able to navigate effectively and, and getting the meaning that is to be found in the document. So let's go to our next item. We're going to first of all look at the parts of a case. Of course, the first part is the style or the caption or the name of the case. The most common format is um, the name of one party, uh, then a lowercase v in a period, and the name of the other party. These could be human beings' names. If they're human beings' names, they will be the last names of the parties. So this is, we'll say this is Susan Smith versus Bob Brown. That would be the complete style, but we usually don't include the first names. We just have the last name. 
me just go ahead and put Susan Smith. And let's say it wasn't just Susan Smith, but it was Susan Smith and Ted Green suing Bob Brown and Javier Gomez. Well, typically we take off everybody's first name. So let me just take that off when we're talking about human beings. And then we take off the second name or the third name or the fourth name. We just keep the first name. You know, the ordering of the names is established actually by the, um, the plaintiff the plaintiff's attorney. Sometimes it's random, sometimes there's a meaning behind it. Um, it, may not be, it may not be that Smith is the main plaintiff. It could have been Ted Green was the main plaintiff, but we're gonna go with the first name in the style of the case. It could be that Mr. Gomez was the main defendant, but Mr. Brown's name appeared first. And so we're gonna go with that. So our smile is Smith v. Brown. At the trial court level, when we haven't actually uh, completed that first round of litigation, it's very easy to look at a style and kind of see what's going on. We know this is the person who filed the lawsuit. We call that person the plaintiff. And we know that this is the person who the plaintiff is suing. So that person is the defendant. There are some other ways you can see formatting. Um, another relatively common one would be the NRA, um, in Ray, uh, in Ray ABC Technologies. That very likely is a bankruptcy case. Um, but we're gonna focus on the style that we see about 90, 95% of the time. And that's the one with the V in the middle. Now, obviously, much litigation doesn't involve one human being suing another. One or both of the parties could be an entity other than a human being. For example, a corporation, a partnership, a limited liability company, um, uh, there are other governmental agencies, lots of different things it can be. But we're keeping it simple at this point, and we're just going to go with human beings' names. Let me go ahead and pull up a case here so we can actually see what this looks like. So here we go. I'm gonna type in Westlaw Court Express. Um, there's lots of different ways to go into Westlaw. There's nothing magical about this one, but I like it. And um, I encourage you to use the same tool because Westlaw Court Express is because it's what I use. It's what's going to make sense to you when you go in. Um, if you happen to go in through a different door, things may look a little bit differently. Change this. And I'm going to sign in. You won't see this screen. This is because I'm an instructor. But you will see this screen. You have to say agree and you hit continue. And I'm gonna to go to this. Obviously, usually you'd be entering a client ID and that's gonna be an alphanumeric combination because this is a class, I'm not gonna use an alphanumeric combination, but um, a common one would be something like, you know, ABC-004 or something like that. I'm just gonna stay with our course number and hit continue. I'm going to go to my history, pull up just a case that we've looked at recently or that I've looked at recently. We'll look at this one here. Actually, let's look at one that's in Texas. That's probably not the best. If I don't like where I've gone, I can hit the back button. So I'm just gonna hit the back button. And I'm gonna find a Texas case, Texas state court case. So here we go. So I'm gonna, we're gonna start this comparison. So the first thing I can see is I'm just gonna take this style, 
this name of the case. I'm going to plop it down in a document. We'll just put it right here. We're going to clean it up a little bit. So I'm going to rephrase this the way that it would be in terms of blue book formatting. I like to, when I'm doing this, have my pilcros on so that I can see where all the spaces are. Make this a little bit bigger. So the first thing I do, of course, is I remove the party designations, the words petitioner and respondents in this case. Then I'm going to remove, well, if this person has an MD on it, obviously we don't need that. A junior, we would remove to PhD, we'd remove. We remove first names, middle names. And we remove, in this case, we've got a secondary and a third party. We just want the first and the second party. I'm also going to set this up so we just have the first letters capitalized, capitalize each word. Now that means, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Capitalize, um, capitalize each word. So I'm gonna have to go back and make that be small. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, and um, I'm gonna choose to put this in italics. You could also underline it. Either one is good. I don't like this font, so I'm going to switch it to Times New Roman and make this 12. So now I have a lovely style of case. So going back to this page, that's what we heard. This is the equivalent, Smith v. Brown. I've just done that for Brown v. Fullen Viter. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. We're going to go to our next slide. So now we're going to look at the docket number. And you don't really care about that. That's not going to be too important. It's right here. I'll tell you a little bit about what this docket number means in case you're curious. The first two digits are the year. So this case was filed in 2000. And it was the 137th case that was filed in the uh, Texas Supreme Court. I'm guessing that's probably pretty early in the year maybe February or March, I'm not sure, maybe it's even January. Um, but uh, whenever it is, obviously, if it were filed the next day, the number would have been, you know, 138 or 142 or whatever the number is greater. So this is just a sequential thing. This is the way the clerk just knows, okay, we've gotten the Brown case, 10 minutes later, we get in the Smith case. Well, that's going to be 00-0138, for example. Not really that important, but I guess if you were trying to find information about this case, having the docket number could be handy um, in terms of getting uh, information. Let's look at the next one, the date of the decision. Okay, let's look at that. How do we find that? Pretty easy to tell, but you notice there are two dates here. So you might pause here and say, well, which one of these dates should I use? Um, this can be a little tricky. Uh, the first thing that I would note is you, you see one date and it's just a date. It doesn't have any descriptors or qualifiers or anything like that. And you see the second date does have some, some words before it, rehearing overruled. When you have a date that has no restrictions, I would say almost always that is the date of the decision. Sometimes you will see this, what will say decided on or something along those lines. Um, and, and so that tells you, obviously, that's the day of the decision. Uh, but when you don't have any qualifiers, that's going to be the date of, of the decision. So the second one you can see is after it. And what happens, the reason that you have the second date is that the decision gets issued, you know, on this date, March 29, 2001, the court, Per curia means it's by the whole court. The, the court, whole court agreed to this particular um, decision. All of this stuff. That was released to the public on that date. Whoever didn't like the result, it may have been Dr. Brown, it may have been Mr. Fullenviter, that person requested a rehearing. Basically what they did was they said, 
We don't like what you decided, which you released on March 29th, 2001. We think you got it wrong. And the only option we have now, which is kind of bad for us, is to ask you to please, please rethink about it. We think you screwed up. As you can imagine, it's very unlikely that those are going to be granted. Almost never are those going to be granted. So we're not at all surprised to see that the request for rehearing was denied. And this is just the date that that denial came down. There are no documents relating to this denial that is part of what we see published after this. This decision, the thing that we're looking at, that went into effect on this date. On this date, when this decision issued, the court didn't even know there would be a request for a rehearing. I mean, they were surprised by it. It's a very common thing to do. And they had no knowledge that they were going to overrule it. So this is kind of information after the fact. Not really something that I would worry about excessively. The reason that it's listed is it lets the reader know, okay, this case is done. The, the Texas Supreme Court is not going to touch this case again. Look, there was a request for rehearing and it was overruled. So they have washed their hands of this matter. We don't have to worry about even the small chance that the Texas Supreme Court will rethink about it. But we don't really care about this date. This is the date that we really care about. Now I've explained to you why we care about this date more than this date, but now I'm going to tell you it doesn't really matter which date we use because we just use the year. And in this case, and this is true for most of the cases, they're going to be in the same year. Now, of course, if this had been, say, late 2001, then this could have been in 2002. So sometimes they will cross from one year to another, and then it becomes important that you know which one to use. But in this case, it's very obvious that we want to use 2001. We don't drill down and look at the month and the, and the day. We just look at the year. Let me see if I can pull up an example that shows you a different format for that. We'll go for another. Actually, this doesn't have any. Let's, see, just, let's look at this one. I'm just curious here. Okay, so here's another one. So when you see the word just decided, then that is um, the date that the decision actually issues. So, so if it says decided or it just has the date and nothing else, that gives you the date of the decision. Here, submitted means every the parties have submitted everything that is necessary for the court to make the decision so it, it was handed off to the court on june 17th and then the court took you know about six months to write their decision reach a consensus on it and issue the decision now of course both of these dates are both 1999 so in some some sense we don't care which date we're using because we're just going to list the year but the decided here tells you this is the one I wanted to use. I mean, let's imagine they had issued it, you know, five days later. So it would have been January, you know, 3rd, uh, 2000. Well, in that situation, we'd be looking for the 2000 date, not the 1999 date. Let me give you one more example. Let's find one. We'll look at this one from a very long time ago, 1932. I'm not even sure how they did it back then. You can see they list just one day. So this one's easy. You were just going to list 1932. Let me pick one more. Again, just one, what? Well, yeah, just one day. So 1930, I mean, it's 1980. So some, you'll see a variety of um, combinations there. Hopefully that's made sense. I'm going to go back to our first. Actually, I'm going to use history for this so we don't have to keep on hitting back and back and back. So we're going to go back to our Texas Supreme Court. We can see TEX here, so that tells us the Texas Supreme Court case. And we're going back to Brown. Let's go back to our PowerPoint now. So we've looked at the date of the decision. Now you may be wondering, why do I even care about the date of the decision? Well, there's two big reasons why we want to. The first isn't so big. We need that for our blue booking. We haven't gotten to that yet to talk about where that goes in the blue booking, but it is an important part of the blue booking process. You do need to add it. So it is definitely something you need for that technical task. 
But the reason that blue booking requires that date is because it's really important to your analysis to know the year that the decision came down. That lets you know, is that still a good law? Let's look at the decision date on this one. So this was 2001. Uh, that's 20 years ago, approximately, give or take a few. And that um, may feel like to many of y'all a long time ago, but for the purposes of the Texas Supreme Court, that's not very long ago. This is probably still a pretty good decision. It's probably unlikely that there's a, been a legislative action that has overturned this decision. And it's probably unlikely that the Texas Supreme Court has uh, made another decision. But if this were say in 1901 instead of 2001, I would be much more suspicious that this was still good law. Um, and in fact, I almost certainly wouldn't quote a decision from 1901. Even if it was good law, when someone sees that 1901, they're gonna be like, why did Groover pick such an old case? Surely she could have found a more recent case that talked about that issue. So they would either think that I'm a, a bad brief writer picking this old case when I could have picked a new one, or more recent cases don't say the same thing. And I'm kind of hiding the ball and somewhat deceiving the court. Neither one of those are impressive. So usually you try to cite cases um, within about 20-ish years, maybe 30 years on occasion. Part of it turns on, you know, how much the, this area of the law has moved, how many times, for example, the Texas Supreme Court has talked about it. You know, if there is a more recent case that talks about this particular concept and it's by the Texas Supreme Court, probably ought to mention it. Okay, so that's the importance of, of, why, of why we focus upon the date of the decision. The next part is going to be, it has lots of different names. It can be called the case synopsis, the summary, or the syllabus. And here we can see West calls it the synopsis. This is not prepared by the court. Let's just go forward and see who the court is. So um, it's per curiam, so it means the whole court decided this case. But, you know, uh, one particular judge obviously spent more time than the other. So we'll say it's just Judge Brown. For just, actually, we won't say Brown because the name of the party is Brown. We'll say Judge uh, Green wrote this opinion. Well, he or she did not write this synopsis. Some editor at Westlaw did it. Maybe an attorney, maybe a paralegal. I don't know. But he or she read this case just like you are reading it and analyzing it. And they, that person, that West editor, reaches the conclusion that this is a fair summary. This is that editor's job. He or she does this, you know, 40 hours a week every week. So as a result, he or she gets pretty darn good at this. Um, and so these are very reliable. They're very good resources to look at. They help people understand what's going on. Um, so if you, if you read the case and you're still not sure what's going on, looking at this might help you connect the dots, especially when you're first starting the process of reading cases. Another benefit to this synopsis is that it helps you do what I call triage. You know, when you do some research, you're probably going to have lots of cases. Usually you have more cases than you know what to do with. It's usually not a situation where you can't find enough cases. You have way more than you need. You can't possibly read the 400 cases you found. So you're going through them quickly and kind of deciding, nope, that's not relevant. Maybe that's relevant. Oh, yeah, that looks really good. And you might have three stacks, you know, yes, no, and maybe. And so reading this little synopsis saves you time. You read this, as, as you can see, this is one paragraph versus this is a short opinion, but still it's gonna take you a little bit of time to read this, especially since this is more written in legalese than the synopsis. There's, there's some legal legalese in the synopsis too, I'm not gonna to lie to you, but it's a little bit more simply put. So this is a lot quicker process and if it's, clearly not relevant to your research, you can put it in the no stack and move on to the next case. And you've spent, you know, 30 seconds, a minute on it, as opposed to maybe five or 10 minutes it would have taken you if you were having to uh, read the whole case. So it's a good way to separate cases from relevant ones to ones who, that are not relevant. Um, you cannot quote these. So let's say, um, this case is really good for your client and you want to quote 
and, and talk about this precedent. Well, you can quote anything after per, per curiam, or would, this is in the same place that you would see the name of the judge. Anything from the word former section 370A all the way down to um, jurisdiction here. Between those things, you can quote the opinion. What you can't quote is anything in the synopsis. This is just the West editor's opinion about what the case says. And so um, it's helpful for you, but you cannot quote it to court. You also cannot quote to the court the West head notes. They're prepared by the same people who do this. And so there's, again, it's not a court action. Then we have the head notes. They're in many respects similar to the case study. Again, it's a West product. It's not prepared by the court. And as we talked about perhaps in class, uh, West has divided up the, the areas of the law into over 100,000 kind of subcategories. So it's a very detailed way of breaking up the law. It would be like if we were talking about biology, we might, we would have a different name for each bone in the finger. So there would be a name for the, 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 the bone uh, where my nail is on my right hand pinky. We'd have one name for that. Then we would have a separate name for the middle bone in my pinky finger on my right hand and so forth and so forth. So that every bone, every muscle, every tendon, every ligament would have a different a way of identifying it. Similarly in the law, we, get, we can get really granular. And so here you can see we have attorneys and services. Um, and we can see that this is broken down into uh, nature and form. Let me just show you what that's like. I'm gonna go back to home base. So I'm gonna click on Thomson Reuters West, Westlaw Classic. And I'm gonna to go to topics and key numbers. This is where the head notes end up. And these are all the different categories. And you can see that there are 414. I think there's actually more than that because you can see some have a letter designation. There we have 135 and 135H. I guess so it does skip to 141. So some have been eliminated, but there's about 400 of these. And if we click on them, we'll discover that they get much more granular. Let's just pick, for example, there's just one category for contracts. So if I click on contracts, you can see, wow, there's a lot more granular. And you can see, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six subcategories. And each one, under the, each one of these categories, you can see there's more subcategories and they even get more granular from here. And sometimes they get even more granular from here. Look, they even get more granular there. So literally within the top, in, in one of these topics, of these 400 topics, just contracts, there's thousands and thousands of these sub subtopics. So it's a very, uh, very specific parsing of the information. I'm gonna go back to history. And I'm going to go back to our Brown versus Fullen Vider case. And so as we look here, this is just one of those categories. We're just going to click on this so we can see where it goes. And you can see we are in section 332, Nature and Form. And you can see it shows you where it, so it's section 46H. And then you can see it's all, this is how granular it gets. So very detailed. So the attorneys who and paralegals who are reading these cases, not only read them for understanding, but then they, they try to decide as they see each topic, well, gosh, what, what very narrow topic is the judge talking about? What, what bucket can we, of the 100,000 buckets we have, which bucket does this idea go into? And so you can see in this case, they only have two of these um, categories. And you can see down here, this one paragraph is about topic one, and this second paragraph is about topic two. But let's go to a different case so you can see ones that have a lot more categories. Well, let's just look at, at um, Martinez versus Martinez. 
So here we have five head notes. One, two, three, four, five. Still relatively low, and you can see here's the one for one. So we can just go back from here to there, goes back and forth, and then two, three, four, five. We'll click on one more case. We'll click on Ivy versus Carol. And this one has nine head notes, but you'll see cases that have 30 or 40 head notes. I mean, not all do by any means, but it's not unusual to have lots of head notes so that you can get very, very granular on cases. And so you can see how, um, uh, what, so let's say I'm reading along in this case and I get to this paragraph and I go, oh, wow, this is really good stuff, but it's just one paragraph. Um, I want to see other courts and how they've handled this particular issue. Well, I see, oh, there's a number one here. Well, let me click on number one. It's going to take me back up to my head notes. And so now I'm going to click on this item right here, nature and form. And look, I'm going to be able to see all kinds of other cases that talk about that very specific, very narrow issue. Here's the case I was just looking at, Brown versus Full and Biter. But Geico Choice Insurance Company versus Stern may be good, especially if I'm in Houston, because you can see this is located in Houston. Um, Honeycut versus Billingsley, again, if I'm in Houston, that looks good. Judwin Properties, again, in Houston, for some reason, there's a lot of Houston cases. Here, this is one from federal court. So this is actually out of the Dallas division. Uh, oh, here's one from the Court of Appeals of Dallas, Griffith. So I found several cases there. I'm going to go back here and you can see that there are actually two topics here, attorneys and legal services, but we also have divorce, operation, and effect. Let's see about that one. That might be, give me some ideas as well. Zavala versus Franco. Okay, this is a very recent case. I'm going to be interested in that. El Paso is not, not my jurisdiction, so I'm less interested in that aspect of it, but still it's a very recent case. So it might get me up to speed with what the courts are doing in this area lately. Here's a federal court. Oh, here's a Houston court, also very recent. Houston court gets a little bit more respect than an El Paso court. So even in Dallas, I'm more likely to cite this one. Oh, look, here's a Dallas Court of Appeal and it's recent. This one's pretty good. Problem with it is it has not actually been reported in the Southwestern Reporter. So that counts as an unpublished opinion. Even though it's published on Westlaw, it's not published in the Southwestern Reporter. So this actually gets a little bit less attention, but still there can be good stuff in here. Oh, this one was published and it's not too old. So a Hennig versus Didic would be a good one for me to spend more time with. Oh, and look, Brashears Brashear versus Brashears. That's another good one. So I'm finding some good cases. I found these simply by using the head notes that this is a, a this prepackages my research so it's a really really neat way of doing it so that's one of the things that make head notes so useful so i can use it to focus on the part of the opinion that's most important to me that's relevant to my research so i can go through the head notes and say wow the head note i care about is number two i don't need to spend time on number one so I can just click on number two. Now, this is such a short opinion. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, some of these opinions are 20, 30 pages long, and it will help you focus. Plus, I can use this same opinion to find other cases, even cases that aren't mentioned in the actual opinion, even cases that hadn't been decided as of 2001. So it's a tremendous A. That's this, this feature, these head notes, is one of the main reasons why uh, people really like Westlaw. It is a uh, comparative advantage that it has over Lexis. Let's continue with our work here. So let's look at names of counsel. Let's see where we find that. That's right under the head notes. Here we go. So we're gonna go down here and you can see the attorneys. It's pretty rare that this is of, of importance, um, but there can be times where you will see, well, this is interesting. The law firm has somebody with the name full inviter in it. So that's kind of interesting. That may be um, related somehow to this gentleman. We don't know that, but it's a possibility. 
Occasionally you'll see names that are, are people of note, uh, attorneys of note. Sometimes you'll even see the names of, of judges. And so you can say, oh, well, if a judge was involved as, a, as an attorney in one of these cases and you're appearing before the judge, that could be a powerful thing to quote. But for the most part, this isn't that useful. Let's go to our next comment. Okay, so the import opinion. Obviously, this is why you're, you care about the case. Starting right here after the judge's name, this is why you're here, for you to read this case and make sense of it. Um, all the other stuff are lovely little add-ons. It's a little bit like um, the candles you put on a cake, but it's not the cake. You know, it's not why you came. You didn't you know, get the birthday cake because you wanted candles. You got the birthday cake because you want some cake. Well, this is the cake and this is what you're gonna spend your time on. The rest of it is nice and lovely, but it's not the big, big event. So as we said before, that the name typically, the, the case typically begins with the name of the judge, unless it's per curiam. And again, per curiam means that it is issued by the whole court. No particular judge is named in the, in the writing of the decision. And that usually happens in a couple of different cases. One is when the matter is very straightforward, uncontroversial, they're just issuing it as a pro forma kind of matter. Usually these decisions are very short and uh, they're not works of great eloquence. They're just short, sweet, and to the point. And so um, the judge doesn't necessarily see the point in associating his or her name with the case. Obviously there was a judge who wrote it or his or her clerk wrote it. Um, and obviously the other judges had to sign off on it, but it's uh, not something that somebody invested a lot of work. It's almost, it would be the, the equivalent of an email that you dashed off in a few minutes. You're not really focusing on writing your best work or spending you know, tons of time sweating every single word when you're dashing off that quick little email. Um, similarly, the judge who is maybe very uh, uh, conscious of his or her uh, writing style when he or she is writing a big opinion, uh, I mean, they're, they're certainly not going to have grammar errors in their procurium opinions, but there isn't that attention to uh, detail. Um, decisions usually begin with a statement of the facts. That's a very common first section. Let's see if this opinion has a statement of facts. Because the procuring, we may not see that. But yeah, we do see it. Actually, and yes, it does appear that it is Don who's the attorney. So we see some facts here. Now let's find a different case so we can get a better feel. Now let's look at the Martinez case. I'm just gonna scroll to the bottom or to when the case begins. So you can see the first thing that happens is we have some discussion about, we see it starts with the name of the judge, and then we have here a discussion. So the first thing that happens is that there's a discussion of procedural history. Let's pause for a second and refresh on the difference between the facts of the case and procedural history. So the facts of the case are what happened that led up to the lawsuit being filed. Why did the plaintiff file the lawsuit? So everything up to the day before the lawsuit was filed, we consider the facts of the case. Then once the lawsuit is filed, everything after that, typically we consider procedural history because it's the stuff that happened related to the actual lawsuit's progress. It's the documents that were filed in the court. It's the hearings that were had. It was the decision that the judge made. Maybe it's the decision that the jury made. Maybe it's the appeals process that happened after the, the case was decided. So when I look at this, I see respondent Yolanda Martinez appeals from a divorce proceeding in Webb County, Texas. Well, she's appealing. So that's a procedural issue. So we're in procedural history. So that divorce proceeding involved the granting of a divorce between the parties and appointing her the managing conservator of the one child of the marriage. Uh, so she got, so that was part of that divorce proceeding. And she received a child support paid by Albert Martinez. And she got a division of the property, real and personal, between the two of them. Respondent, and we know that's going to be Mr. Martinez. Let's look up here. We can actually probably see it up here. Well, actually, they're calling it. Um, Apollyon 
appellant, but um, um, okay, well, yeah, I'm sorry, respondent is Ms. Martinez, and I apologize. They're calling them appellant appellant, but they're also the app appellant here. is also the respondent. Respondent filed an answer. Oh, I'm sorry. So she appeals from a divorce proceeding made by the petitioner to be made by petitioner Albert Martinez to her and making a division of the property. Respondent filed an answer but failed to appear at the trial. Respondent timely filed a motion for a new trial which was overruled by the trial court following a hearing. And so then we have, so we're, we're really just getting a lot of um, procedural stuff. I mean, we haven't heard anything about their marriage. Why did um, Mr. Martinez want a divorce from Ms. Martinez? We haven't heard that. We haven't heard why Ms. Martinez was awarded managing conservatorship of the child instead of Mr. Martinez. We haven't heard how the monthly child support payments were established between the two. We haven't heard anything about what property existed in the community, what was what real property existed, what personal property existed, nor have we heard how that property was divided between the two of them. So we haven't heard any facts of, of, of you know, the, the, the case beforehand. We're just hearing about the procedure. Let's see if we actually hear anything. So I'm looking at this, it doesn't look like there's any facts of the case. That's pretty unusual. In most cases, you will see this. Let's see. Let me just pick one that maybe we'll have. Let's look at the history. Let's look at Ivy versus Carol to see if that might provide a more traditional one. Okay, so this starts also with, with procedure. It's not unusual to have a paragraph or so. Um, actually, this is all procedure too. So can you like let's go to Sheshinov. And we're gonna go to the Johnson case. Here we go. Uh, this is one where you see a difference in the year. So this one, because we have the word decided, this is the one that we really care about. 2006 is the date of this case. The data that says argued is when they had oral argument in front of this court. So you can see there was almost a two year delay between the time of oral argument, which is probably about the time of submission that we saw before and this decision issuing. And we're going to see there were 18 head notes here, so significantly more. Then we go down here, we can see that Judge Willett, a very prominent uh, Supreme Court justice, um, I believe he may be on a federal court now, sorry. Um, he issued the opinion, so the opinion actually starts in this case, all the way down. to here, we actually have a concurring opinion. So we don't actually go farther than that. So let's look at, uh, Judge Willett is, is known to be a very good writer. So let's look at what he had to say, how he structured it. So we have some procedural information, but you can see here, and it's commonly called the background section. We really start with some information about what happened. Petitioner Alex Sheshinov's management services provides consulting services to banks and other financial institutions. Well, that's definitely not a fact, a procedural history fact. This is a fact that happened before the lawsuit was filed. When Alex Sheshinov management services began providing these consulting services, there was no lawsuit between, you know, when that, when that event began, there was no lawsuit between um, it and Mr. Johnson. 
So that's definitely a fact of the case. Let's see the next one. Respondent Stephen uh, Kenneth Johnson began working for ASM in 1993 as an at-will employee. Well, that clearly happened long before he filed this lawsuit. He didn't file his lawsuit and then start working for ASM, right? At the time he began working there, he had no idea he was ever going to sue his employer, nor did the employer have any idea that Johnson would sue it. On April 1997, ASM promoted Johnson to director of its affiliation program. Again, at that time, ASM had no plans or had no idea that it would be in litigation with Johnson, and I'm sure Johnson had no idea that it, he would ever sue ASM. And so we keep on going with the facts, and it goes on all the way down to here. So all of this are all of this from this word up until this word are all facts of the case. And you can see when it changes right here. ASM sued Johnson. That's when we get everything after this is likely to be the procedural history. Let's just see if that's the case. Because sometimes they throw in some facts. So that's clearly a procedural history fact. So on Sunday, they don't give us the date, but whatever that date was, we move from facts of the case to procedural history. So ASM sued Johnson, alleging breach of the covenant not to compete and seeking injunctive relief and damages. Strunk intervened, intervened in the lawsuit. So filed documents in front of the same court that ASM was suing Johnson. The court granted a temporary injunction. All of this is procedural history. All this is happening within that court. Strunk and Johnson then moved for summary judgment. Where did they move for summary judgment? In that court. And they argued that the covenant was unenforceable as a matter of law. They argued that under a particular footnote in a particular case, ASM's promises to provide confidential information and specialized training were illusory at the time that the agreement was made and the covenant was therefore unenforceable. Where did they make those arguments? In court. The district court granted the summary judgment motions. Who did that? The court. So all of this is procedural history. The court denied Strunk's request for attorney's fees, however, and entered a final judgment. All of this is procedural history because it all happened in the court. Somebody's filing something in the court or the court is making a decision. But it doesn't end there. Let's look at the next paragraph. The Court of Appeals affirmed. So now we're in the appellate court. So somebody filed an appeal. We don't know, except we can go back up here and see that the petitioner is um, Alex Sheshinoff Management Services. But we kind of expected that it was going to be Alex Sheshinoff's uh, Management Services because after all, um, Johnson won. <laughs> so it's pretty unusual for somebody who won to, um, to file the appeal, right? So we kind of see it coming that um, ASM would file the appeal and oh, poor ASM, it lost because the Court of Appeals affirmed what happened at the trial court level. And the trial court pretty much sided with Johnson. So ASM lost again. It, so the it here is the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals held that under this particular footnote, the covenant was unenforceable because the promise to provide specialized training confidential information were illusory when the promise was made and therefore do not comport with the act's requirement that the agreement be enforceable when it was made. And here's a little quote from that decision. So if I were gonna color code this, I would start right here and have everything one color. Then it would end here, my facts of the case ended. And then here would be my procedural history stuff. Maybe I'd put that in pink or whatever. Okay, so let's go back to our um, thing. So it's going to start with the facts case. And again, sometimes I'll have the procedural history first. Sometimes I'll start with the facts of the case. Either way, it's fine. It will then discuss the relevant law and will apply the facts to the law. Let's look at that in Sheshanov. So that's going to usually be in the section called discussion. And you can see what, the, what Judge Will does here. He cites the legal standard. He goes, look. What's important for us as we're deciding this case to consider is this particular statute. Let me go ahead and just quote it. 
So he goes, pay attention to this because this is what we're going to be using here. Then he also says, hey, you know what? Another thing we need to look at is this uh, case light versus sin gauge. And especially, um, and so he says, so, hey, in light, we know we've got to look at it according to this. And then it talks about the facts of light. What happened in light? So it's analyzing that light decision. And it continues on talking about light. And the we here is referring to the court because even though the light decision was in 1987 and here we are in 2006, so probably there aren't any justices on the Texas Supreme Court that are the same. I mean, that's 19 years. There might be one or two, but most aren't going to be the same. So you might say it's kind of weird to say we when you're talking about nine different people, or at least mainly different people. But um, we use the term, or judges use the term we to refer the, to the court itself. So the people could be completely different. And they're still saying, well, the Texas Supreme Court ruled, ruled this way. Yes, the Texas Supreme Court in 1990, 1987 didn't include Judge Willett, and I'm the one writing this, but I'm not writing this as Don Willett. I'm writing this as the Texas Supreme Court. And whoever issued the light opinion back in 1987 wasn't issuing it as, let's just see, wasn't issuing it as, oh, John Cornyn, <laughs> our senator right now. Uh, John Cornyn wasn't issuing this decision as John Cornyn. He was issuing it as the Texas Supreme Court. So it's a kind of a different way of thinking about it. So we can see here, we're seeing a lot of analysis. And we'll see later on as we look into this, that, oh, now the court, after having explained the, 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 the big case, the light case, and it, and of course, it is talking about this statute here. So the light case is discussing the same statute. But once the court kind of tells us how, how to interpret that, that, that case, then it applies that information to the facts of ASM. In the pending case, ASM promised to disclose confidential information to provide specialized training under the agreement, and Johnson promised not to disclose confidential information. The covenant was ancillary to a part of the agreement under the two requirements of light quoted immediately above. So they tell us what light says, and then they take the facts that are important from the case that they're looking at right now and apply those facts to the requirements of those other cases in the statute and say, wait, they match. We Bingo. It's almost like you know, a game of bingo. Bingo. I have a B, an I, a G, an N, and an O. I'm good. And so we're able to read, the court is able to reach a decision that yes, under these facts, hey, it wasn't ancillary after all. It was, I mean, it was ancillary to the agreement. So it is a binding. It's not illusory in that particular situation. So that application of the law to the facts is a really important part. Well, eventually you'll get to the, to the holding. Let's look at a few places where we'll see holding in an opinion. Let's go back to this case. This case is not a super easy case to understand. So I'm gonna to point to some places where you can find holding in this case. Well, one is you can find it in the synopsis. Now, again, this is not the uh, part that Justice Willett wrote but this is what the Westlaw editor wrote. Still, it's, it can be, give you some good hints. Let's read it here. The Supreme Court held that, and they're saying there's three holdings in this case. Non-compete covenant need only be ancillary to a part of the agreement at the time the agreement is made. Okay, so one thing you may notice in this is it's almost written, uh, for those of y'all that are of a certain generation, you may have heard of, or you may have, may remember movies, again, from a long time ago, in which uh, there would be telegraphs or things like that mentioned, where people would drop A's and B's and A's, and that's kind of what they do here. So you might even add those back. It helps it, helps it read a little bit better. So I'm going to add it in so it reads a little bit more smoothly. The Supreme Court held that a non-compete agreement 
need only be ancillary to or part of the agreement at the time the agreement is made. So you can kind of fill in some of the blanks. So that's the first holding. Second holding is the covenant was enforceable. And declaratory and the and the declaratory judgment and the court is entering a declaratory judgment that the employment agreement was not enforceable at the time it was made. And then finally, the covenant was reasonable. So we have three holdings here. So I ought to be able to look, because again, this is stuff that somebody at West pulled out of the, the opinion. So I ought to be able to find these three nuggets um, in the opinion. Maybe not with the same words, but uh, with the same meaning. Okay, so I'm going to show you places that I would expect to find that in the actual decision. Oftentimes it's in the first paragraph. The first paragraph is often like a, uh, a summary, an executive summary. Hey, in case you don't want to read the whole case, um, we're going to give you the Cliff Notes version. And we do have that here. Let's see. Uh, today we modify our holding in light and hold, whenever you see the word hold or holding or held, it's a good chance that you're going to have the holding of the case. So we hold that and at will's employees non-compete covenant becomes enforceable when the employer performs the promises it made in exchange for the covenant. So we have a holding there. And then in so holding, we disagree with language in light stating that covenants not to compete act requires that agreements contain the covenant to be enforceable the second the agreement is made. So we could say it also holds that the covenants not to compete act does not require the agreement containing the covenant to be enforceable the second the agreement is made. So you can see how we're, we're coming up with the pieces. Now, of course, you're going to also be able to find it in the discussion section. Um, oftentimes, if there's three holdings, they may be spread out, you know, because uh, they may talk about one holding and the next holding and the next holding. But many times they will also be at the end. So let's look there and see if we can find that at the end. You can see here, we know that one of the holdings that they told us at the beginning was the covenant was reasonable. And we can see here, that was actually one of the um, topics here. Reasonableness of the covenant. See if we can find that. We conclude, that's another good word to look for when you're looking at holding. If you see the word conclude, we conclude that Johnson's covenant with ASM was reasonable under that statute. And then in the conclusion section, we get the disp disp disposition, which just basically tells you who won what part. It doesn't, it's very helpful for Johnson and Strunk and ASM to know that, but reading this in, in, in isolation from the rest of the opinion doesn't really give anyone who isn't one of the parties to the case a lot of information about uh, what's happening. So the holding tells us who won and what happens next. Um, and, and actually, this is more the disp disposition. So the, the holding is the is the more the, the theoretical, the, the, the nugget of legal principle that this case stands for. The disposition is who won, what happens next. Let's just look at this for a second. So we reverse the decision of the Court of Appeals that ASM take nothing against Johnson and Strunk. So the Court of Appeals said, ASM, you take nothing. You aren't going to get any money from Johnson and Strunk. The um, Texas Supreme Court is saying, not so fast, Court of Appeals. We don't agree. We think ASM may be able to win this case and make Johnson and or Strunk pay ASM money. Okay. That's the first thing. The next thing is we reverse the judgment 
oh, say, we affirm its judgment that Strunk not recover attorney's fees against ASM. So Strunk is still out of luck when it comes to attorney's fees. And that's not a surprise because after all, the Court of Appeals said Strunk won, but it also said Strunk doesn't get attorney's fees. The Texas Supreme Court is saying, no, Strunk, you aren't winning anymore. We're saying ASM win. So obviously we're not gonna make ASM pay your attorney's fees. I mean, that, that would be silly. The, the winner doesn't have to pay the loser's attorney's fees. And we remand the case to the trial court for further proceedings. So remand means send it back because the fact that ASM won the, in the Texas Supreme Court doesn't mean that Johnson and Strunk have to pay ASM any money right now. All it means is that it's no longer uh, the rule that for sure Johnson and Strunk don't have to pay ASM money. It's going to go back to the trial court for more hearings. It may still easily work out that ASM doesn't take any money from Johnson or Strunk. Um, it could be that the jury concludes that no, uh, that that's not going to be the case. It just means that because it's going to be remanded for further hearings, that there's a possibility now. Before it was 100%, no way Johnson, no way Johnson and Strunk were going to have to pay ASM any money. With this decision by the Texas Supreme Court, the door has been opened. There is now a possibility, maybe 1%, it may be 99%, but there is a possibility that um, ASM can win at this point. So that tells us what's going to happen next. Okay, now we're going to talk about the types of decisions that we see. Now we're mainly going to focus here on appellate courts and on Supreme Courts. So if we are in an appellate court, again, you notice it's appell eight. So we're not talking about appellant. An appellant, let me write that word here. Appellant is the party who is appealing. Obviously, they aren't neutral. They're on their own side, just like the appellee is party who opposes the appeal. Obviously, the appellee is on the appellee side. So both of these are partisans, but the process and the court is not on the appellant side, it's not on the appellee side, it's neutral, it's disinterested. And so the appellate is the, the name of the court. Okay, just wanna make that clear because appellant is usually pronounced appellate, which sounds a lot like appellate. So there's a subtle difference in pronunciation. I try to emphasize that, but when I emphasize it, I don't want you to think people really walk around saying appellant. They don't, that uh, would be a misunderstanding. So in our system, whether we're in the federal court or the state court, our appellate courts have three judges. Let's just look at some examples so we can see. Um, here we are in the Texas Supreme Court. I'm just gonna go to, um, the, um, Austin Court of Appeals. So this is the case in the Austin Court of Appeals. And we'll see there are three judges here. And I'll also see there were 21 issues. So, yeah. so we have Justice Law, Justice Smith, and Justice Patterson, three justices. You'll always see that there are three just, there's always an odd number of justices. And the typical numbers are one, that's a trial court judge number, and you wanna have just one judge in a trial court because you have to have decisions that happen fast. I mean, the witness is in the witness box. A question has been asked. The other side is objecting to the question. You need a judge who can decide in real time before the witness has to answer. So the judge has, you know, 10 seconds. I mean, 30 seconds, maybe a minute or two if it's something that really requires some thought. But you don't want the judge to continuously be saying, well, uh, I need a recess, I need to go research that issue. Because if that happens every time a party makes an objection, what would ordinarily maybe be a three-day trial becomes a three-month trial. That's not efficient for anybody. That's not a good system. 
And you can see how if you had a multiple uh, justices, judges on the panel, then you'd each time there was, you know, a, an objection, you'd have to have them, well, let's talk, well, I don't agree with that, well, I think that is. I mean, it would make it very wieldy and difficult. So you just have one judge on the trial court level. But once you get to the appellate court level, there's a lot of reasons why you want more than one judge. After all, if uh, you just had another judge hear the case, again, why is that judge better than the first judge? Um, the reason that you want to have more on the appellate court judges so they can talk amongst themselves and have that collegiality, that exchange of ideas, the idea of, you know, two heads are better than one. Well, three heads are better than two heads. At least that's the idea. Also, there isn't the time urgency. There's no witness in the witness box. I mean, a decision has issued. And really, it doesn't make a ton of difference whether the decision issues in January or February. Um, and so the fact that it's going to take longer to reach a decision on the point isn't a huge issue. It, it, at this point, we're more interested in getting the decision perfectly right than in speed. So we have three justices on this level. Again, we need an odd number so we can have a tiebreaker. Most of the time, the decisions are unanimous. But it, it doesn't always happen that they're unanimous. And in that situation, you want to have a tiebreaker. And you can see in this case, uh, Jan Patterson was the decision maker. If we go up to the Texas Supreme Court, let's go to that decision. We'll see that there are nine justices. There are some that can be less than nine. Maybe um, uh, justices had passed away or resigned or recused himself or herself. But the vast majority of time, there are nine. Let's look here and see. So we have the person who authored the decision. His name goes first or her name goes first. Then you can see we have Hecht, Brister, Green, and Johnson. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have five justices who join in the majority opinion. Let's see. Uh, I mean, it's possible for there to be one or two missing, but to have four absent, I'm thinking that some people either filed a concurrence or a dissent. And you will usually find that at the end of the decision. So let's go to the end of the decision. And here we have, we see Jen, Judge Wainwright, so number six, concurs. And we, he has published a decision explaining why he concurs. And if I go higher, oh, I can see that we have some more concurring opinions. So this is number seven, or seven, number seven here is Jefferson with O'Neill. So this is seven and eight. And we already saw Wayne Wright. So it looks, oh, and also Justice Medina. So we have all nine accounted for. So five signed the majority opinion, three signed one concurring opinion, and one signed another concurring opinion. So that is how the, the, the voting happened. Again, it's very common for it to be nine zero for all the justices to agree, but you know, when you have nine people, someone's gonna have disagreements. That's just the nature of any enterprise and certainly judges are not immune from that. So when we have more than one justice, we have the issue, the possibility of having less than a unanimous decision. So let's look at the ways that this might happen. So, um, Obviously, one thing that can happen is the decision can be unanimous, meaning they all agree. So it's a 3-1 decision or a 9, excuse me, a 3-0 decision or a 9-0 decision. Um, 
a unanimous decision is the strongest type of decision that a court can issue. Um, it means not just that we know who won, but it wasn't even a close call. It was a very straightforward decision where there really isn't any serious ambiguity. This is well-established ideas. Everybody on the court was seeing the case the same way. So that's a really strong precedent. Um, but, you know, not every case is going to be a unanimous decision. And think cases that are non-unanimous decisions are still precedents in many cases. So we're going to look at those and evaluate them. So let's go to our next page. So we've already said unanimous is when all judges agree. Then there will be a majority decision. This is when more than half of the judges agree. So if we only have two, if we only have a panel of three judges, this would be a two one decision. Now the two is the majority part. The one could be a concurring opinion or it could be a dissenting opinion. Let me explain the difference between concurring and dissenting opinions. A concurring opinion is when the justice agrees with the outcome, but he or she arrives at that decision in it for a different reason. So let me give you an example. Let's say um, you have a two-one split and the two justices say, we are ruling in favor of Mr. Green because we think the law at issue is unconstitutional. And so therefore it's not applicable and therefore Mr. Green wins. Well, the justice who disagrees with the majority opinion might be writing a concurring opinion. He might say, I agree that Mr. Green wins, but I don't agree that the law is unconstitutional. He agrees because even uh, with this law that I believe is constitutional, um, he fully complied with the law. And so therefore he uh, is, is uh, the winner. So they arrive at the same result as the majority opinion, but they arrive at it in a different way. Another thing that could happen though is that this other justice could be writing a dissent. And that means that he or she agrees with the outcome. So not just the reason for the outcome, but the actual outcome. So maybe the majority opinion, the two that say, uh, one thing they say, well, Mr. Brown ought to win. Well, if the other person is a dissent, then they're saying, well, no, I think Mr. Um, Baxter ought to win instead. So they would have a different winner in that particular case. So a concurring opinion is not the majority opinion by definition. A dissenting opinion is not the majority opinion by, by definition. And I was doing with, with, two, with a, a panel of three, but you can see it works with any of the other combinations. Obviously a 5-4 in a Supreme Court is a very close call. A 6-3, still pretty close. A 7-2 is you know, pretty weighted towards the majority opinion. An 8-1 is very weighted in the majority opinion. So you can see this is a weaker precedent than this. Because it's easier to imagine that this will this balance will shift over time. I mean, only one of the spots has to flip before this group, especially if this is the dissenting group, not just a concurring group, but a dissenting group, before they go into the majority. So maybe all you need is another election if you're in front of a state Supreme Court, or if you're in front of the US Supreme Court, maybe all you need is for um, one member of the uh, Supreme Court to uh, resign or retire, and then the next president appoints somebody who has a different perspective on that issue. And what was a 5-4 could suddenly become a 4-5. And so you can see how this is weaker than this. You have to have a lot of people change for this to change. So the majority opinion, especially if it's an 8-1, is a strong precedent. Not quite as strong as a unanimous opinion, but still very strong. A concurring opinion isn't strong at all um, because it didn't win. It was the losing argument. So it really has no precedential value. The only value to it is that um, it uh, is the strength of the arguments that it advances. I mean, there have been cases in which a concurring opinion um, 
was uh, later, a few years later, uh, held to be the majority perspective, again, with a change in the court. Um, uh, let me just think. Hardwick, Bowers v. Hardwick. Bowers, Hardwick. That's an example right there. Of that. That phenomenon. One of the dissents in this case became the dominant perspective. So uh, maybe this opinion by Stevens, Brennan, and Marshall. Because just 10 years later, this decision was overruled. So this is actually a little more than 10 years. So this was decided in 86. So about um, 17 years later, um, this case came up um, in 2003. And, and the, the, the view that had been the dissent became the law of the land. So huge change there. But until the court changes its mind and reverses precedent, um, concurrences and dissents, you can cite them, but you have to make it clear to the court that you're citing it to, hey, I'm not citing the majority opinion. I'm citing the concurrence. And the court's going to be like, well, yeah, that's lovely. Maybe I even agree with what the concurring opinion says or what the dissenting opinion says, but my job isn't to decide on my own what the best argument is. My job is to follow uh, either the unanimous decision or the majority decision. The only time that a court can kind of consider overturning a decision is when it's at the same level as the decision that is being cited. And then it can revisit it. If it's a president of its own court, it's in a or if it's a lower court, it can say, wait a second, I'm not sure that's right. And so at that moment, it has the ability to look at concurring opinions and say, wow, there's some merit to this. But again, it's unusual for a concurring opinion ever to take the day. Let's look at dissents too. Again, this is written by a judge who disagrees with the holding of the case. Um, and obviously not only the holding, but also the legal reasoning. Uh, sometimes more than one person will join a dissent. We saw that in the Bowers v. Hardwick case, that it was three justices getting together. Similarly, more than one justice can join a concurrence. Again, we saw that in the Sheshanov case. The, the, the idea that is perhaps most difficult, though, to get one's head around is plurality. So this is when you don't have a majority case. So before, remember we said that a majority is when more than half of the judges agree. But you almost always will either be in, in a situation where you have a unanimous opinion or you have a majority. But it's mathematically possible that you might have neither one of these. Let me show you some examples. You might have a situation where four justices agree to do A. A fifth judge agrees to do A, but for a different reason than the first four. And then four disagree and don't want to do A. In that situation, you don't have a majority opinion. There isn't a single opinion that more than half of the court will sign off on. So you can see when you have a plurality, you have not just two groups, you have at least three groups. You may even have more than that. So here we have three justices who are agreeing to do, who want to do X for reason Y. We have one judge here who also wants to do X for reason Q. And we have another justice who wants to do reason X for reason B. These two don't agree with each other and neither one of them agrees with this first group as to the reason Y but they all want the same outcome. But then we have four who are united in their disagreement with both the reasoning and the outcome. You can see in both of these cases, not a single opinion has the majority of the folks. So we have a plurality. So how do you decide which one, which opinion is the most important? 
Well, even though we have more than three opinions, there are only two sides. There's only two results, right? So you have, at least with respect to each idea, you either have um, A wins or B wins, right? So you have to tally these. So here we have, let's just look at, let's go back and look at this decision where we have four, one, four. So this, these three people say their decision is A for reason B. And then this person says, yes, I decide A for reason C. And then the remaining four say, I decide not A, I reject A for reason D. So now we're trying to, to tally up which side is the winning side. Well, so we're gonna count up the people who voted for A for whatever reason they voted for A. We don't care about the reason right now, we're just focusing on the count. And we're gonna compare that to the number that voted not A. So we have five, four and one voting for A and four voting for not A. So A wins. That's what's going to happen. That's the outcome of the decision. So now we know that one of these is, we, we don't have a majority opinion, so we know we have a plurality instead. So one of these decisions is going to be the plurality and one is going to be a concurring opinion. So you pick whichever one has the most votes within that category. So here we can see that this is going to be the plurality because it has four is more than, than the so I'm going to put that, um, we'll put that in blue. The, the one in red is the concurring opinion, and the one that went not A is the dissent. Okay, so let's look at the next one. You might look at this in first and say, well, obviously it's going to be this one right here, number four or the one that has four voters, because four is more than one and it's more than three. So that must be what the plurality is gonna be. Well, let's see. So we know that um, the first three voted not Q for reason G. Then the next group voted not Q for reason H. And now we have this other uh, lone person who voted not Q for reason J. So they, all three of these groups voted not Q, even though they each had a different reason for that. And these last four voted Q for reason P, they're all one group. So now we're gonna count up and see, well, did Q or not Q win? Well, Q had four votes, not Q had three plus one plus one. So that's five votes for not Q. So not Q beat Q. So we know that the plurality is going to be one of these. So now we're looking for the one that has the most votes. Well, three is more than one and three is more than one. So this is the plurality. Let me put it in blue like we have the other one in blue. And then these two are both concurring opinions because they're on the winning side, but they aren't the, they aren't the majority and they aren't the um, uh, plurality. And then because these, these four voted the opposite way, they are the dissent. So you can see that even though this one got more votes than the plurality, the plurality is this guy or this group. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna cover this one more slide, then we'll call it good. We already talked about what a procurium is. It's issued by the whole court, often in routine matters, often a very short opinion. We saw that before. A memorandum opinion is also 
very similar to this. Many times it's even kind of shorter. For example, it might be the denial of a, certi a certiorari petition. So it may just be a single line. It's more of an order than say an opinion. Let's look at the term en banc. We oftentimes think about Latin as being the language of the court system. Uh, certainly the vast majority of stuff in our court system is in English, but yes, we do use Latin fairly commonly. But there's another language that is also really important to our court system, and it's Norman or court French. If you think back, as we know, you know, England was invaded by William the Conqueror in 1066, and he was a Frenchman from Normandy, northern France, and so when he came and took over England, guess what language he wanted to speak? He wanted to speak French, not just French, but Norman French, which was a little different than Parisian French. And um, uh, he, the, the people he brought over with him, his friends and his fighting co companions, they were all Frenchmen as well. They spoke French. And so they set up systems based upon speaking French. And so the first judges were French speakers. And so when they would issue rulings, they would be in French and they would use French terminology. And this actually went on for hundreds of years. Um, even when uh, most of the people, even some of the, the, the ruling families had started speaking English more than French, it kind of became a tradition. Now, if you go to England now, obviously people are speaking English in the courts, not uh, French, unless of course they happen to be from France and then they get a translator. So that's not a regular thing now, but some of the terminology that we have harkens back to that time, you know, in the very early uh, history of England where French was still a real influence. And so this is where we get the term en banc. En banc means basically on the bench. And you can kind of see it in that term en banc, on the bench, it sounds kind of similar. And you may have heard of judges, you know, for example, issuing rulings from the bench or sitting on the bench. And you may have wondered to yourself, why do they say that? They're not sitting on a bench. A bench is uncomfortable to sit at for a long time. It looks like they've got really comfy chairs. You know, they're uh, nice and upholstered and big and uh, they probably got lumbar support. They roll around. I mean, these are nice, nice seats. They aren't benches. You may have wondered why people use that terminology and it goes back to uh, the word bench in English is a, uh, uh, the English version of the word bonk. So um, just a little trivia about that. So when you heard the term en banc, it's a French term. It means on the bench. And what it means literally, if we're going to translate that into everyday English, is it means this happens when all the judges of a particular circuit hear a case. So it's the complete bench or it's all of the judges in that particular circuit. Now we talked about, um, let's go back to, Brown versus full inviter. And we said there was a rehearing overruled. Well, very likely the rehearing would have been an en banc request, especially this is in front of the Supreme Court. So the whole court hears the first hearing. Now, there is no um, a smaller section that, that hears cases when it goes in front of the Supreme Court every single justice who doesn't recuse himself or herself is going to have a vote in the decision. But when you are, say, on the appellate court level, you only have three justices who hear the court. Well, each one of our circuit courts have lots of justices. So um, you, only, uh, you, the litigant, are only having a small portion of that court actually hear your case. If in fact, every single justice on the fifth court of appeals or the 10th court of appeals, or whatever the court of appeals is, had to hear the case, think about the logistics. You'd have to have so many people in the same place hearing the same evidence. 
it would be tremendously inefficient. Uh, there would be a tremendous backlog of cases. So instead of having every justice hear it, what they do is they assign groups of three. Um, now, of course, usually that's not a problem because um, you know the, the three can speak for the, the larger group, but every now and again, you might get three weirdos, you know, three people that have really quirky views on the court, uh, maybe very conservative, maybe very liberal, just maybe weird. And so every now and again, those three justices might issue an opinion that the rest of the court are like, what were they thinking? What was going on there that they would issue such a stupid decision? Well, if in that case, the litigant who lost says, wait a second, you know what? This, this, this decision is a loopy. It doesn't follow precedent. It's just not based on reality. Maybe I ought to request a hearing en banc. Have the whole court hear this. Now, obviously that request is almost always we're going to be rejected because it's a big hassle to get all those justices together. I mean, they're only going to do it if it's a really big issue and they really feel like those three justices mess things up big time. But every once in a blue moon, they will reach that decision. So you can make the request. You know, you're probably not going to be successful, but hey, it never hurts to ask, I guess. If you don't have any other choices, this is at least something you can do. So a hearing on a request for a hearing on banc is a request to hear for the whole bench to hear your particular case. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, we will uh, continue with this material at a later time. Uh, continue to look at the PowerPoint to get up to speed with what's going on. I thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.